يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا با وواب نجاة الأمة يا غريب الغرباء يا مذلوب كربلاء السلام على من جعل الله الشفاء في تربته السلام على من جعل الله الشفاء في تربته السلام على من الإجابة تحت قبته السلام على ساكن كربلاء فيا ليتنا ثم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي يا سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما أما بعد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أتيع الله وأتيع الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم صدق الله العلي العظيم وآمنا به زينوا مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد the revolution of Karbala was not a random event that happened to take place due to the political and social circumstances that governed the day it wasn't an undecided or unplanned move that was reactionary due to the political situation. Abadan la. You find that this event and this revolution of Karbala, this revolution of Sayyid al-Shuhada was one that was prophesied by the Anbiya from before. This was a revolution that was ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that the creator of this universe and the creator of everything within existence out of his divine wisdom decided that the religion of Islam would prosper because of this revolution in this manner. Which is why you find as Imam al Hussein is leaving and he's been asked, why do you move towards a land? Or why do you take a stance where you shall potentially be killed? You find that Imam al Hussein replies by saying, Sha'allahu an yarani qatila. It's the divine will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I should be martyred in for the religion to continue. They say to him that why do you take your women? If you were going to be killed, then why take your women and children? He says, Sha'allahu an yarahunna sabaya. It is the divine will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these women will be taken as prisoners paraded from city to city. And this is a sacrifice that these women shall give such that you and I can have a deen to follow today. And therefore you find this event of Karbala was divinely ordained. It wasn't a reactionary move that was unprecedented or uncalculated. La, 
Anbiya before Rasulullah prophesied and wept about Karbala. We wept over Ashura. You find that the entire event of Karbala is summarized in one verse of the Quran, beginning of Surah Al Maryam. Kaf ha ya ain sad. In the book Kamaluddin, you find that this book in itself which was authored upon the command of Imam Sahib al-Amri wa zaman Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif He narrates that one of the companions during the time of Ghaybat al-Sughra writes a letter to the 12th Imam through the Nawab and he asks for the ta'wil, the hidden meaning and the secrets behind this Opening verse of Surah Al Maryam. He says, What does it mean? Kaf ha ya ain suad. And you find that the answer comes from the Nahi al Muqaddasa. Yani, an answer from the Imam himself, Imam Sahib al Amr. And he says that during the time of Nabi Zakariya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had granted Nabi Zakaria these five names. He had given him the ma'rifa of the Ahlul Bayt, such that whenever Nabi Zakaria was in any type of difficulty or was in any type of tribulation, he would mention these five names. Which are these five names? Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. And as Nabi Zakaria would do their dhikr and would mention their names, every time he would mention the name of Imam al Hussein, he would be overcome with grief and tears would flow down his eyes. And entum janabkum, your hearts are pure, lovers of Ahlul Bayt. You will be able to attest to this that sometimes when you go to Karbala al Muqaddas, and just the moment that you see the dhari or you see the qubba al-mubarak of Imam al Hussein and Abu al-Fadil, you are overcome with tears. Sometimes you do not even need to go to Karbala. In the Janabak, you can be watching a Shia channel and you find in the broadcast the haram of Imam al Hussein is there and your, your heart is overcome with grief and you have tears in your eyes. This is a love and a mawadda that has been granted to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we said yesterday. For Nabi Zakaria, the same thing. And he asks Allah, he says, Ya Allah, why is it that every time I mention the name of Imam al Hussein, I'm overcome with tears and grief? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Nabi, through Angel Jibra'il sends down this verse, Kaf ha ya ain swad, where Jibra'il recites the maktal and the masa'im for Nabi Zakaria. Ajib. Entum ashabul ma'rifa. What does this mean in the hadith? The reciter of the masa'ib is Jibra'il. The one listening to the masa'ib is Nabi Zakaria. Allahu Akbar. Who is this Hussein ibn Ali? Jibra'il tells him, Kaf ha ya ain sad. Entire Karbala is summarized in this secret, in this one verse, Huruful Mukatta'ah. Nabi Zakaria asks, What does this mean? Jibra'il says to him, Kaf Karbala, that land on which Imam al Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah, will be placed under siege. Surrounded by enemies from every direction. Ha, yani hilak ahlul bayt. The manner in which they will be martyred and they will be killed and their blood shall be spilled. Ya, the one responsible for this massacre, Yazid bin Muawiyah al Ain, Ayn, to represent Atash, the thirst of Imam al Hussein and his family. To be killed in a manner which is thirsty. And you will be able to tell. 
even from your own experiences, that when Shahrul Ramadan al Mubarak comes, perhaps a person is able to withstand hunger. But one of the most difficult things to withstand is thirst. For what about Sayyid al Shuhada and the children of Sayyid al Shuhada in Karbala? Atash. Which is why, and you will find this is a crucial part of the Masa'ib. And to Mahibai from today until Ashura, every time you drink a glass of water, remember Imam al Hussein. Remember the thirst of Rukayya, Sakina, Sukaina. Remember the thirst of Ali al Asghar. And send salam on Imam al Hussein three times and la'na on his killers before you drink this water, as for the hadith of Imam al Sadiq. Vishma. For Ain Atash, Sad, Yani, Sabaya, those women who will be taken prisoners from city to city. And you find that when Jibrail recited and narrated the secrets behind these alphabets which make up the huruf al Nabi Zakariya is in a constant state of weeping and grieving for Imam al Hussein. Therefore, coming back to our topic, the event of Karbala was one that was prophesied from the beginning of time. Anbiya before Rasulullah wept for Imam al Hussein. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma swalli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Wept for Imam al Hussein a number of times during his life. Many times he wept for Imam al Hussein privately, and many times he wept for Imam al Hussein publicly. Accounts like these are narrated by ulama, by scholars from the Ahli Shia as well as the Ahli Sunnah. You find that Khawarizmi in his book, Ad-Dair Sa'ir, he narrates that one time Rasulullah is returning back from a journey in, back to Medina. Upon returning to Medina, Jibra'il descends upon Rasulullah. And he narrates to him the manner in which Imam al Hussein is going to be killed. Rasulullah begins to weep. Upon reaching Medina, he goes to Masjid al Nabawi. He sits on the member. Imam al Hassan and Hussein are sitting by his side. Rasulullah, after delivering the khutbah, looks at Imam al Hassan, looks at Imam al Hussein. He puts his hand over the head of Imam al Hussein and looks up towards the heavens, beginning to cry. And he says, Ilahi, Balagani or Akhbarani Jibra'il bi anna hada waladi al Hussein maktulun makhdul. Rasulullah complains in the masjid in front of the Sahabi. He says, Ya Allah, Jibra'il has informed me that this son of mine, Hussein, is going to be killed. Maktul, makhdul. My Ummah is going to deceive him and betray him. فَبَارِكْ لِي فِي قَتْلِهِ وَجْعَلْهُ سَادَةِ الشُّحَدَى Ya Allah, bless me through his martyrdom and make him from the leaders of all the shuhada, of all the martyrs to have lived and to walk, who have walked across the face of this earth. And Rasulullah ends with Tabarra. He says, Allahumma la barik qatili wa khadili. Ya Allah, do not shower your mercy upon those who killed him and those who betrayed him. The narration goes on to say, فَذَجَّ النَّاسِ بِالْبُكَاءِ the Arabic word that is used is Dajja. Dajja from the word or one of its derivatives is Dajij. Dajij, there was an outcry. People were wailing in Masjid al-Nabawi in the loudest voices. Rasulullah looks at them and he responds by saying, this is all narrated by Khawarizmi. It's not from the Ahl-Shia. He says, Rasulullah says to the people, 
atabkuna wa la tansurunahu do you cry for imam al hussein while you are the ones who are not going to help him allahumma anta takun lahu waliyan wa nasira ya allah you be the helper of imam al hussein for therefore you find that this advent and this revolution of Karbala was one that was prophesized from the beginning of time. It was not a reactionary event that took place by fluke or wasn't an uncalculated measure. La. If we understand that the revolution of Karbala was ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we come to understand that every act of Imam al Hussein, every decision and every step he took prior to the revolution of Karbala was one that entailed divine wisdom. You find that Imam al Hussein diligently worked from the time of the death of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan al Lain all the way up to Ashura, every decision taken by Imam al Hussein was governed by divine wisdom. Every step he took was a calculated measure to ensure that Ashura would be the single most powerful day through which people would be able to seek guidance until the day of judgment. Every measure of Imam al Hussein, every step of Imam al Hussein was a calculated decision that had oceans of wisdom behind it. And you find that, inshallah, we shall try to analyze some of the parts of the revolution of Imam al Hussein and discover some of the wisdoms behind his movement before Ashura. As you know, for a revolution to be successful, it is of utmost importance that the planning behind the revolution has to be absolutely precise. The timing of the revolution has to be precise. A revolution in terms of its occurrence is not sufficient to cause a massive change in the way Imam al Hussein did. La, the occurrence is an occurrence is one thing, but planning the revolution is something else. Timing the revolution is something else. For you find that as per after the death of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, the revolution of Imam al Hussein consisted of four stages. Upon the death of Muawiyah, Imam al Hussein stayed in Medina, what is famously narrated or what is mashhur between the historians is that. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan died on the 15th of Rajab 60 AH. And dates can differ, different historians have different opinions. And it is narrated. 15th of Rajab 60 AH. Imam al Hussein stayed in Medina for a period of two weeks. This was one phase of the pre Karbala revolution. After that, Imam moved from Medina towards Mecca, where he spent almost four months and ten days inside of Mecca. This was the second phase. The third phase of his revolution was the travel from Mecca to Iraq. This whole period lasted for 26 days. And the final stage of the revolution was from the second of Muharram when Imam al Hussein reached Karbala. Therefore, our point of analysis today is the Meccan aspect of Imam Hussein's revolution. Imam al Hussein stayed in Mecca for four months before this advent of Karbala. How did the Imam deal in Mecca and why did he choose Mecca? Inshallah, are some of the points that we shall try to discuss with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. The historians mention that Imam al Hussein left Medina on the 27th of Rajab 60 AH to go towards Mecca. Why did Imam al Hussein leave Medina and why did he perform this hijrah from Medina towards Mecca? Historians tell us that Imam decided to leave Medina because Marwan had threatened Imam al Hussein that if he did not give bay'ah to Yazid, he would kill Imam al Hussein inside of Medina. Which is why Imam al Hussein overnight abruptly gathered together his family 
and a few of his companions. The narrations mention that this initial kafila that left from Medina, majority of them were his family members from Bani Hashim. And from his Ansar, he had only 10 supporters at this point in Medina. From these 10 supporters, majority of them were from the servants in his house, including Joan, this Joan Sahabi Jalil, who we refer to when we recite his ziyara, we say, Bi Abi Antum wa Ummi, Ya Joan, may my parents be sacrificed for you. Mawla Abu Dhar, he was from the slaves or the servants of Abu Dhar. And then you find there was another companion by the name of Sulaiman ibn Razin, who was from the servants of Sayyida Rabab. Like this, ten companions and Bani Hashim. Imam al Hussein moves from Medina to Mecca. Tayyib. Person might ask a question. Imam al Hussein left Medina to go towards Mecca. Why? Because Marwan threatened him with death. Does this mean that the Ma'asum Imam is scared of death? Person might ask this question. Intum Janabkum, if somebody asks you this, why did Imam al Hussein leave from Medina to Mecca? We need to have answers for this. If we say that the Imam was scared, does this mean a Ma'asum Imam is scared of death? Abadan la. The idea over here is that Imam is not scared for his death. Imam is Ma'asum Imam. Why would Imam al Hussein be scared of death? He was already given glad tidings that he is Sayyid Shabab Ahlil Jannah. This Jannah which people are looking forward to go to after death. Imam al Hussein is the king of this Jannah. He has no fear of death. Then why did he leave Medina? Not out of fear for his life, but because he wanted to ensure that if his blood is spilled, it is spilled with a revolution that shall then go on to save Islam. And Medina was not the place for this revolution. Hence, you have a timing of when the revolution should occur. This is number one. Number two. The fact that Imam al Hussein left Medina abruptly upon the threat of death is a great lesson for us, which we need to propagate in this day and age, particularly in the West. Imam al Hussein left Medina, and this in itself was a symbol that the true teachings of Rasulullah, the real Islam, the Islam of Ahlul Bayt does not advocate violence. Imam al Hussein left Medina to prevent a confrontation which would potentially become violent and Imam al Hussein left by him leaving. This is a teaching that Islam is not a religion of violence. Islam is a religion of peace. Today, when you look at the image of Islam which is portrayed, whether it is here and or in the Middle East, one of the leading reasons for which Islamophobia is becoming so prevalent is because of this violent nature of Islam, which is portrayed. Islam of who? This is the Islam of Bani Umayya, the Islam of Bani Abbas, that justifies killing under the name of religion. Imam al Hussein over here drew a line and steps back. He says, La. And you find every step of the way Imam al Hussein embraces a non violent stance, even on the day of Ashura. You find that Zuhair ibn al Qain wants to begin when Umar ibn Sa'ad al Lain insulted the Imam. Zuhair asks, he says to Imam, How dare he speak with you like this? Give me permission to go and challenge him with my sword. What does Imam al Hussein say? Symbolic message that needs to be propagated, especially here in the East, in the West. Imam al Hussein says, I shall not be the first one to wage a war. Islam of Ahlul Bayt teaches you non violence. Yes, if you take the Islam of Bani Umayya and Bani Abbas, this is the Islam of violence. For you find that the wisdom behind Imam leaving Medina was twofold. Number one, to advocate a stance of non-violence. And number two, in that he was preserving his blood and was now setting the foundation for a revolution much greater. And that is the revolution of Ashura and Karbala. 
The narration mentions that Imam al Hussein left Medina on the 27th of Rajab and arrived in Mecca on the 3rd of Sha'ban, 60 AH. Imam al Hussein then lived in Mecca from the 3rd of Sha'ban until the day of Tarwiyah, 8th Dhil Hijjah. Tayyib, why did Imam al Hussein select Mecca? Some people are of the opinion that Imam al Hussein chose Mecca as a place of residence because he had a large number of supporters in Mecca. However, if you were to research history, you find that this is actually not accurate. Ibn Abu al-Hadid al-Mu'tazali, who has written a commentary on Nahj al-Balagha of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he states that Imam al-Sajjad, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, Upon returning from Karbala, made a statement where he says, "Ma bi Makkatin wa Madina ishroon rajulan yuhibuna ahl al bayt." In the entire Makkah and Madina, I cannot find even twenty people who love ahl al bayt. Ajib. In the entire Hijaz, I cannot find twenty people who love ahl al bayt. This is not a situation that happens overnight. This is a result of enmity and hatred towards Ahlul Bayt over a prolonged period of time. Therefore, what is understood from this is that when Imam al Hussein went to Mecca, he did not have loyalists or supporters. In fact, majority of the dwellers of Mecca at that time were from the Quraysh even though they had come into the fold of Islam these are people who held in their hearts hatred for Amir al muminin because it was Amir al muminin who fought and killed the kuffar of Quraysh in the battles before Islam whether it was from Badr or Ahad, Khaybar and Hunayn and therefore even though they came into Islam they had this Res they had this reluctance and this hatredness which was buried inside their heart for the family of Amir al muminin so Therefore, you find that Imam al Hussein did not have supporters in large numbers inside of Mecca. If this is the case, then why did Imam al Hussein go to Mecca? And you find over here again two points of wisdom. And that Imam al Hussein, Masum Imam, guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every act of his is one of diligence and hikmah. For the two reasons that we shall discuss why Imam al Hussein went to Mecca. Number one, Mecca was a strategic place in terms of location. And even the timing was strategic in that from the time of Sha'ban all the way up till the month of Dhil Ka'ad, this was the recommended time to perform Umrah. That's why you will find the Umrah Rajabiyya is Mustahab, Umrah in the month of Sha'ban is Mustahab, and then you will find from the months of Shawwal coming into Dhil Ka'ad and Dhil Hajj, the season of Hajj begins. And therefore, Imam al Hussein saw that Mecca is a strategic place to be in, keeping in mind that it is the recommended times for Umrah. And now that the time of Hajj is setting in, there will be people who will be coming from the entire Islamic Ummah coming to perform Hajj. Do you know at that time the Islamic Empire was equivalent to 50 present day countries? including the entire Middle East and North Africa up to the shores of Afghanistan and Azerbaijan and the 50 present day countries for Imam al Hussein saw that the opportunity is prime the area the location is strategic Mecca the time is strategic people from the entire Islamic dunya are going to come here for Hajj and this will be the perfect time to give the revolution of Ashura a global voice and maximum exposure look at the wisdom behind the dealing of Imam which is why you find the historians mention that as soon as Imam al Hussein came to Mecca, he was flooded and was meeting with people from all over the Islamic Ummah who would come to see him. Imam al Hussein had taken his residence in the Sha'ib of Abi Talib, his grandfather. 
and you find people from North Africa, people from Hejaz, those who would read the Quran, who are coming for Hajj, the Muslimin would read in the Quran, But they never knew who is this Ahlul Bayt. Now when they would come to Mecca for Hajj, they would say, this is that Imam al Hussein under Ashabul Kisa. And they would kiss his hand and seek guidance. And Imam al Hussein would take this opportunity to bring them towards Ahlul Bayt. People in the Quran read about Mubahala. They read... Abna'una wa abna'ana wa abna'akum. But they had never seen who is this abna'ana. Now when they came to Hajj and Imam al Hussein was there, they said, you are the abna'ana who is mentioned in the Quran. Imam al Hussein would say yes. And therefore you find that his being inside of Mecca was a strategic decision where he was able to give the message of Ashura and the message of Karbala a global reach and a global voice such that the next year, when people heard that Hussein ibn Ali was killed in Karbala, they were in shock and terrified. This Imam who was mentioned in the Quran, grandson of Rasulullah who we met last year has been killed. And this is one of the reasons which then led to the people to stand up in rebellion against Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas. Bani Umayyah Afwan. For you find that Every step of the Imam is governed by divine hikmah. This is number one. The second reason as to why Imam chose Makkah in that the Imam was selected Makkah because Makkah being the central land of the Muslim which holds the Kaaba. This Kaaba which is the central definition and the focus of Tawheed upon which the religion of Islam is built. Imam al Hussein went to Mecca and invited people towards Ashura in order to show them, Ya Ayyu al Muslimin, you cannot separate the concept of Imamat and Wilayat from Tawheed. Both of them are one. As per the verse of the Quran, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Ati Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says obey Allah and obey the Rasul and the Ulil Amr the Ulil Amr is who as per the Mufassirin of the Ahli Shia and Sunnah they say the Ulil Amr is Ahlul Bayt led by Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad there is no distinction, there is no infikak. You cannot separate between Tawheed, Nabuwa, and the Imama. La, the complete deen is made up through these three founding principles. As per the Quran, obey Allah, obey Rasul, and obey the Ulil Amr. You cannot say that I will obey Allah but disobey the Prophet. La, neither can you say I will obey the Prophet and disobey Allah. La. Neither can you say that I will obey Allah but disobey the Imam. The deen is built on a structure and this structure is based on three primary founding stones. Tawheed, Nabuwa, and the Imama. The Prophet leads us towards Allah and you find that the Imam protects and safeguards the teachings of this Prophet. For you find that the Imam came towards Mecca with these two primary decisions in his mind and that it was a strategic location. He would be able to give the message of Karbala and invite the people towards Ahlul Bayt at a global scale. And number two, it was his being inside of Mecca was a personification of this verse that Imama and Tawheed are two central concepts that cannot be separated from each other. If we understand this, what was the role of Imam in Makkah? What did the Imam do for these four months and ten days that he was there in Makkah? Number one, as we said, he would visit or the Hujjaj would come to visit and he would deliver khutbas to the Hujjaj from all over the Islamic empire, guiding them towards the true Islam of Rasulullah, guiding them towards that form of Islam which is non-corrupted and non-deviated. This is number one. Number two, you find the Imam wrote letters to the people of Basra inviting them to come towards his support and stand up against Yazid al in revolution. Historians mention that he wrote letters to the heads of the people of Basra, the tribal chiefs, because Basra at that time was a very 
tribal community in order to get to the majority of the marshes, you had to gain the support of the tribal chiefs and the tribal leaders. Imam al Hussein writes letters to them inviting them. You find none of them responded to Imam al Hussein except one person by the name of Yazid ibn Mas'ud al Nahshali. He was able to gain the support of two tribes, the Bani Hanzala and the Bani Tamim. And he writes to Imam al Hussein saying that I have got the support of 1,000 men. And I am coming towards you in Mecca to support you. When Imam al Hussein received this letter, he prayed for his mercy. But by the time Yazid ibn Mas'ud was able to finalize the logistics and gather these 1,000 men to come towards Mecca, the 10th of Muharram had already happened. And he found out that Imam al Hussein has been martyred. <coughs> and he was filled with regret. And it is also interesting to note that from the entire province of Basra, there were 10 people from the province of Basra who ended up joining Imam al Hussein, and from these 10, they were part of the 72. <coughs> Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> For the first function of the Imam or the duty of the Imam in Mecca, was that he invited the hujjaj from all over the Islamic nations. Number two, he wrote letters to invite the people of Basra towards his revolution. Number three, the imam responded to the letters of the Kufans. As you know, the people of Kufa had written letters to support Imam al Hussein, such that Sayyid ibn Tawul says the number reached up to 12,000 people. But Kufa, having a history of betrayal, you find that Imam al Hussein from Mecca responded to the people of Kufa by sending them his representative and his ambassador, Sayyid Muslim bin Akil, rahmatullah alayh, towards Kufa in order to check and to verify whether the stance on the ground matched the motivations and the sentiments within the letters that were found. For you find that the Imam was engaged in three basic functions during his time in Mecca. As the Imam was performing these duties, Bani Umayyah was not silent. As you know, for every political and ideological movement that happens on the ground, you will always find that the dictatorial regime is always thinking about countering and recountering any form of revolution and opposition that is brewing within the ground. And therefore it is also important for us to see what exactly was Yazid al-La'in doing at this time for these four months that Imam was in Mecca and was gathering support from the Kufans and was expanding his reach outside of Hijaz. What was Yazid al-La'in doing? The government of Bani Umayyah in itself undertook a number of steps in order to counter Imam al Hussein. The first thing Bani Umayyah did is that they planted spies in every part of the Islamic nation inside of Hijaz. They planted spies to spy on the people so they are able to distinguish who are the Shias and the followers of Imam al Hussein and who is not in order to be able to gather intel and intelligence just like the way they did in order for to capture Muslim bin Akil. This is number one. Number two, you find that Yazid al La'in consulted his drinking partner known as Sir John. So, if you were to try and understand the political atmosphere using terms of this day and age, you have Yazid al La'in, the self proclaimed king, and then you have his prime minister, Sir John. He went to Sir John and says to him, how do we counter this rebellion which is brewing from Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam? Sir John looks at him and he says to him, if we use current political terms, Sir John advised Yazid to perform a cabinet reshuffle. You will find that there were about, from all the 50 present-day countries that consisted of the Islamic Empire, there were certain states 
that were strategically important. And you find this even today, even within current uh, democratic and political uh, systems that we have, I am sure even here within the United States, you will find that during election time, certain states are more strategic than other states when it comes to getting votes, correct? Same thing even during the time of Imam al Hussein, you find that the states of Mecca, the state of Medina, the provinces of Basra and the provinces of Kufa, these four provinces were strategic provinces, not only because of the history, but because of the ideology. Medina being the city of Rasulullah, Makkah the house of Tawheed, Basra was the place where the battle of Jamal had taken place, when Aisha, Talha and Zubair decided to come out against the Imam, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you find Kufa was the last capital of Amir al-Mu'mineen, that strategic capital through which he reformed Islam, a reformation that had never seen before. And therefore these four states were strategic. Sir John advises Yazid, you need to have a cabinet reshuffle. Those ministers or those governors who are in charge of the province of Mecca and Kufa, you need to dispose of them and you need to replace them. You find that the governor of Basra was Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. The governor of Kufa was Nu'man ibn Bashir. The governor of Mecca was Amr ibn Sa'id al-Ashdaq. And the governor of Medina was Walid ibn Ataba. For Sir John tells Yazid, why don't you perform a cabinet reshuffle? You need to demote Nu'man ibn Bashir because he was not able to cope with the revolution that Muslim bin Aqil was performing. Which is why if you try now and figure, put together the history, you find this is why Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was sent to Kufa. Nu'man ibn Bashir was removed. For Sir John tells him, you need to remove Nu'man ibn Bashir. As a governor, he's weak and not able to control Kufa. And on the other hand, you need to demote Walid ibn Abi Sufyan or Walid ibn Ataba from Medina. Why? Because he was not able to control Imam al Hussein. Under his watch, Imam al Hussein left Medina and has gone to Mecca. So you need to demote these two governors and then you need to consolidate between the province of Basra and Kufa and the province of Mecca and Medina. Consolidate both of them by having one governor for each. Therefore, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad became the governor of Basra as well as the governor of Kufa. And Amr ibn Sa'id al-Ashdaq became the governor of Mecca as well as the governor of Medina. So what they did is that they minimized control of four states in, with two governors who ruled with the most brutal of acts. They would go to any extent to subdue the people and coerce them into submission to Yazid, even if it meant through bloodshed. So you find that the first reaction of the government is that they planted spies amongst the people. Number two, there was a cabinet reshuffle. Number three, they performed public executions in order to threaten the people and to scare them from supporting Imam al Hussein. An example of these public executions that were committed by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad al laeen was the public execution of Mitham al-Tamar and Hani ibn Urwa. What was, how was Hani ibn Urwa punished for supporting Muslim bin Aqil? The narrations mention Hani was 90 years of age. Shaykhun Kabir. How do we treat our elders? With gentleness. The narration mentions they brought Hani ibn Urwa and Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad hit him with a metal rod on his face until he broke his nose and the skin from his forehead and his cheeks were peeled off hanging over his beard. This was the way they punished him for supporting Imam al Hussein and Muslim bin Aqil. Eventually after Muslim bin Aqil was martyred, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad commands for Hani ibn Urwa to be killed and for his dead body to be tied to a horse and to be dragged along the streets and the city of Kufa on the day of Eid. Why? Make an example out of him. Invoke or incite fear in the hearts of the people. When they see a dead body being dragged by a horse, nobody will ever think of supporting Imam al-Hussein again. 
And this you find is the same tactic used incidentally by terrorists such as ISIS inside of Iraq, these public executions that they cover. Why? To incite fear. Al Qom Abna Al Qom. Bani Umayyah of then today, these are the Bani Umayyah of today. Allah Kullin, this is the law, this is the third strategy which is implemented. You find finally when they were not able to contain Imam al Hussein and there was a near victory in Kufa by Muslim bin Akil, the last thing the enemies did and that Yazid did is final attempt was to send assassins who were disguised as Hajjaj, as Hujjaj in the wearing their ihram to come towards Mecca and they made a plan to assassinate the Imam while he was performing the rituals of Hajj. As soon as Imam al Hussein got this information and this intel that the government has sent assassins in order to kill him, you find that the Imam left Mecca on the 8th of the Hijjah, Yawm al Tarawiyah, according to what is Mashhur, and went towards Iraq. And from Iraq, you find that the Imam was then confronted by Hore bin Yazid al Riyahi and then diverted his travel of direction to Karbala. Allah, Allah. Before we talk about Karbala, allowed salawat ala Muhammad wa ala. The narrations mention that Imam al Hussein reached Karbala on the 2nd of Muharram. Yani on a day like tomorrow. Fa'antum ahibai. From tomorrow, as you go to school and as you continue with your jobs, do not forget Imam al Hussein, do not forget Karbala. During the entire day, keep in your mind and live these 10 days as if you are with Imam al Hussein. Remember this Masa'ib. Remember Imam al Hussein reached Karbala on this day. Even your attitude and your actions and the way you behave should be different in Ashura, at work, at school, everywhere. It's not only that you are in a state of mourning and weeping only during the time of Majlis La, when you finish the Majlis, when you go home, the way you deal with your family, the way you are at work. Hinta Sahibul Aza, you are overcome with the grief of Imam al Hussein. The narration mentions that on the 2nd of Muharram, on a day like tomorrow, Imam al Hussein reaches the land of Karbala. Allah, Allah, what is the land of Karbala? Karbala is the land of tears, Karbala is the land of grief. Karbala is the land of sacrifice. Karbala is the land of freedom. Karbala is the land of ishq. Karbala is the land that every lover dreams about. Karbala is the land of shifa'a. Karbala is Jannah. Hadith al-Sharif, Mu'tabar bila shak, narrated by Imam al-Sajjad, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Hadith is mentioned in Kamilu's Ziyarat where Imam al Sajjad speaks about this Karbala, this land which you and I dream about going to. Imam Sajjad says, Inna Allaha ittakhada Karbala haraman. Aminan Mubarakan Kabla Ayakhluka Ardil Kaaba Bi Arbaata wa Ishrina Aam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the land of Karbala and made it into a haram which is Mubarak and the haram which is sacred 24,000 years before he created Mecca and the land on which the Kaaba was built. Ajeeb. Person might come and say, Shaykhuna, is this not an exaggeration of the maqam of Karbala? How can you say that the land of Karbala was more divine than the land of Mecca? This is a ma'asum imam saying it. This is not an exaggeration. Ahibai, had it not been for the sacrifice of Karbala, Mecca would not have any value today. 
If Mecca is the land of Tawheed, Karbala is the land of the savior of Tawheed. For Imam al-Sajjad says that Karbala was created 24,000 years before Mecca, made haram, made sacred, 24,000 years before the Kaaba was created. And then he goes on to say, فَإِذَا زَلْزَلَ اللَّهُ فَإِذَا زَلْزَلَ اللَّهُ وَسَيَّرَهَا on the day of judgment, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا When this zilzal and this earthquake happens and the entire uni or the entire land is flattened, Imam al-Sajjad says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall raise the land of Karbala فَرُفِعَتْ بِتُرْبَتِهَا كَمَا هِيَ هِيَ Turba Nuraniya Safiya. Allah will raise this pure land of Karbala in the way that it is towards the heaven and shall make it from amongst the gardens of the gardens of heaven. And nobody shall reside in Karbala, which will be the highest level of Jannah, except the Anbiya and the Mursaloon and the Awliya. The Awliya are those lovers of Imam al Hussein. فَكَرْبَلَا جَنَّةِ This is that Karbala that Imam Al-Hussein reached. And to Ahibai, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us a chance to perform the ziyarah of Imam Al-Hussein. But those of you who are preparing to go to Karbala for Arba'een, you prepare for your ziyarah from now. Karbala is that muqaddas land where you are now going to put your feet on that land where once upon a time the blood of Joan and the blood of Habib ibn Madahir and Muslim ibn Ausajah was spilled. With which iman, which yaqeen, which amal will I come to Karbala? I have to prepare and think from now. The tradition mentions that on the second of Muharram, as Imam al Hussein was coming towards Karbala, he reached towards the land. When he reached across this desert, the horse of Imam al Hussein stopped to move. Ajib. When Imam al Hussein reached this desert plain, his horse stopped riding. Much as Imam al Hussein would try to make the horse move, the horse would not move. Abu Mikhnaf in his maktal says that when the horse decided not to move any forward, Imam al Hussein changed his horse. He rode upon a second horse, but even the second horse would not move forward. Like this, seven times Imam al Hussein changed horses, but none of the horses would move forward. And it is as if the horse was trying to tell the Imam, I do not want to take you to a place where you are going to be martyred. Allah, Allah, she ajib. You find that even the Dhuljana on Yawmul Ashura, after Imam al Hussein was killed, when it returns back to the tents and it sees the women were crying, the hadith mentions that the Dhuljana, out of grief, went and hit its head on the rocks and the boulders until it died out of grief in Karbala. The haywan, the animals wept for Imam al Hussein. For the narration mentions that seven horses Imam al Hussein changed, none of them decided to move forward. At this point, Imam al Hussein asked the people, Oh people, what is the name of this land? Somebody came forward and said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, this land is known as the land of Ghadiriyah. Imam al Hussein says, Is there another name for this land? A companion comes forward and he says, Ya Aba Abdullah, this land is known as the land of Nainawa. The Imam says, Is there another name for this land? A third person comes up and says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this land is known as the land of Shati al Furat, the river banks of Furat. Allah, Allah. You hear Furat and enter Janabak, your mind goes towards Abu Fadl al Abbas. Imam al Hussein asks, Is there another name for this place? They say this place is known as the land of Karbala. The narration mentions that as soon as Imam al Hussein had Karbala, he said, A'udhu billah min ard karbin wa bala. I seek refuge in Allah from the land of difficulties and the lands of tribulation. 
Sayyid Ibn Tawus in his Maktal mentions that as soon as Imam Al Hussein got off his horse, he took a few steps on this land of Karbala. The earth or the sand behind, underneath his feet began to change into the color of Zafaran, yani the color of blood. And as soon as this happened, a dark wind blew across the land of Karbala, blowing dust into the face and the beard of Imam Al Hussein. Allah, Allah. The narration mentions at this time, Um Kulthum looked at Imam Al Hussein. She comes to him and she says, My brother Hussein, my heart feels very heavy. My heart is felt with grief. This land does not look like a land that is Mubarak. For Imam Al Hussein says to her, Oh, Ubin Kulthum, go back to the rest of the ladies. This is the land from which you are going to become a prisoner and I shall meet Allah. The narration mentions Imam Al Hussein then told his companions to settle their horses and to settle their tents. He then took his companions and he said to them ha huna ha huna mana khore ka bina ha huna masfak dema ina ha huna katlu atfalina imam al hussein took his companions and he said to them this is the place where we shall be killed this is the place where our children shall be killed this is where our blood will be spilled allah allah the narration mentions that at this point all the companions began to weep with Imam Al Hussein. This is Karbala. This is the land where blood will be spilt and women will be made into widows and parents will be children will be made into orphans. Ajib Ahibai today, second of Karba, second of Muharram. Ya Shi'at Al Hussein, I have a message for you from Imam Al Hussein. Allah Allah. Imam Al Hussein is speaking to each and every one of you. There is a message which he gave through his daughter Sayyida Sukaina. The narration mentions, the maktal mentions that on the 11th of Muharram, as all the women were made into prisoners and they were leaving to go towards Kufa, Sayyida Sukaina, when she passed through the Maidan, she saw the body of her father Imam Al Hussein. So she threw herself on the body of Imam Al Hussein. Huh? But which body is this? This is a body of Imam Al Hussein whose bones have been broken because they've been trampled upon by horses. Sayyida Sukaina says that as soon as I threw myself on the chest of my father, manhar. she says that I heard the voice coming out from the manhar. Do you know what is the manhar? The manhar is the part of the neck from where the head was severed, severed from the body. <laughs> Sayyida Sukaina says that I heard from this area a voice where Imam Al Hussein sent a message, and Imam Al Hussein said to me, Bunaya Sukaina, Balligi Shiati Salami. She says, Oh Sukaina, Imam Al Hussein says, Oh Sukaina, send my salams to my Shia. Allah, Allah. Imam Al Hussein is sending you his salams from Karbala. Alayka salam, ya Aba Abdullah. Ba'ad. What does Imam Al Hussein say? Huh? Imam Al Hussein tells his daughter Sukaina, Ku balighi or ikra'i shi'ati salami, wa kuli lahum, ya shi'ati, mahma sharibtum udhba ma'in fadkuruni. Imam Al Hussein says to Sayyidah Sukaina, tell my shi'a that every time they drink water, whenever they drink water, they should remember me. Allah, Allah. But what else? The Imam says, Wa in same tum an gharibin, O shahidin fandibuni. Oh my Shia, whenever you hear about a shaheed or a gharib, I want you to weep over me. This is the wasiyah of Imam al Hussein for you and me, Ya Ahibai. Is there anything else? Allah, 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 Ya Shia al Hussein, put your hands on your heart for this masaib. Look at what is the last wish of Imam al Hussein. Huh? The narration mentions Imam al Hussein tells Sukaina, Tell my Shia, later kum jami an fi ashura tanduruni imam al hussein says i wish my shia you i wish you my shia were there on ashura to look at me ajib ya imam al hussein why why 
do you want us to be in Karbala and to see what ya Aba Abdullah he goes on to continue came for us to squint he says i wish you were there to see how i quenched the thirst of my infant Abdullah radhi i went to them asking for water but they replied back by shooting him with a tube إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ وَلَعَنَتُ اللَّهِ عَلَى أَعْدَاءِ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ مِنَ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ مَاتَ مِنْ حُسَيْنٍ